welcome back to the Tax Advisor and Biz Coach Success Podcast. The purpose of these episodes is to help entrepreneurs become more successful, avoid tax and other business headaches. Remember to tune in frequently as we will be sharing tips, secrets, and expert recommendations in how you can manage your finances, improve wealth, and grow your business. Please like, share, and subscribe. Here's your host, Liz Soria. Hello, folks. It's your host here, Liz Soria, with the Tax Advisor and Business Coach Success Podcast. In this week's episode, I have another amazing um, expert guest that is joining us, and and by the name of Steve um, Atchel, Um, and he's actually a a professional when it comes to uh, recruiting and the right questions, the right interviews, and I think this is such a great topic because as we expand our business, a lot of times we just don't hire independent contractors, we hire employees, and we need to understand the steps and the proper things that we need to do to, well, hire the best and, and go through that pre-qualification. Uh, so, um, Steve, uh, we're going to be discussing about why a resume is not enough or what we call curriculum vitae, as we call it, CV. CV. Um, so, welcome, welcome, Steve, to our show. How Thanks are so you? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Excellent. And again, I'm sorry, the name of your company? Solstice Consulting Group. Great. So, Steve, um, First of all, I'm always very curious how people start in the field that they do. So do you mind sharing a little bit about your background? What made you feel that this was something that you really wanted to profound and and, and, and have a better control and understanding to be able to help other people out there? Sure. Um, Well, I started my professional career. I lived in Japan for about four years and I speak the language and I was an interpreter and a translator and I did business and how do you mean my stay? Arigato. And, uh, that's uh, all I know how to say me. Well, that's thank you. Is it, it, am I right? Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I could have lied and said that was a really offensive word, but it's not. Okay. Um, so I, I worked for the, I'm from Detroit. So I worked for the big manufacturing companies and I was with Ford and Mazda in Japan and um, worked for, a, I had a number of uh, quote real jobs um, and I was always like the marketing or business guy and I was a user of data. So if we were selling machines across North America and Europe and uh, Asia, right. I would want, you know, the data on who our customers were and what the install base was. And, you know, um, I think you start with data to try and make informed any kind of decisions, marketing or advertising or sales. Mm-hmm. And uh, we used these different systems, and uh, a couple years after my last real job, um, I was working for myself, and I met a woman who's now my business partner, who she brought me into her company, Elizabeth Newbold. She's fantastic. She's an expert in business intelligence, data warehousing. So it's, a, it's kind of a niche within IT um, that I think IT is a word when people say information technology, it's so broad that it means everything from you know, fix my printer yes. to very technical, high-level business analytics, right? But there's a definition. I think there's a, there's a separation sure. to the IT, yeah. uh, you know, tech, you know, general name that is being called. Right. But, it's, but when you say IT staffing or IT consulting, you really have to almost explain to people that are in the business. Um, and because I was a user of these systems, I wasn't the technical smart guy, but I was a user of them. I understood the services that her company were selling. And I used to consult for a CEO that she was trying to work with. And I made the introduction and we started working together. And now I'm, you know, her and I just run this company. So we have companies like GM and Apple and Chevron that we worked with. Um, and then a number of, you know, mid-sized companies. Thank you. Big names, yeah. Uh, and by the way, you kind of fade a little bit your, your audio. So it's really important, especially because a little bit closer. Let's see. How's this? Is this better? I think so too, yes. Okay. Um, very interesting. So you came from that background in, 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 in from the- I was the business guy that used the data and now I'm the business guys that sells the consultants that can help you use the data. I guess that's a, the best way of putting it. Okay. So I understand the value of it. I'm just not smart enough to move all that data around and all these complex systems. But the thing is I know smart people. So that's what we do. You know what? It, this is what I say over and over. Uh, every time I, you know, I'm, grateful I have to say to, to bring so many amazing guests into to my show 
uh, for your time and, 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 you know, all your, your knowledge and experience, because I think it helps so much the audience. It really does. I hope and so. I, yeah. I hope I can share some things that are helpful. And I thrive for that. Um, and, and here's the thing that I, I find very interested in, 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 in the field. I've been out of being an employee for many years. I, mm. I, I, I probably <laughs> been in business now for over, over eight years now. Mm -hmm. And yes, I know what it is to be an employee because I came from sure. that company, you know, um, but I also seen, because I, I was an accountant, and a lot of times sharing the same office with an HR manager. Okay? Uh, and, 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 and sometimes overhearing things. So you, know? you were around hiring and firing and onboarding and well, interviews. Well, and at least most of the time, you know what it was? Most of the time, Steve, uh, yes, I was overhearing conversations and issues and you know who's pre-qualified, who's going to go through the second interview and all that. And I always felt there was something not right. I mean, there was not something, the structure of HR managers have a huge function in a company and they're beyond just looking at a resume and figuring out whether this person on paper looks good. Hmm. Yeah. So would you mind bringing up a little bit of how it was the proper way of understanding, you know, um, the recruiting process. How do we really yeah. can pre-interview, not just based on the paper and a nice summary and, and everything mm. else. Let's talk about a little bit about that. Would you mind, please? Yeah, of course. Well, I have, uh, I'm, I'm very much against resumes, but they're, they're kind of the, um, we, we still have to do them. They're kind of a necessary evil, unfortunately, for now. I think they'll go away someday. But I have to kind of back up and give you my perspective on the whole process because I think resume, reviewing resumes and trying to identify what candidate might be good for interviewing and eventually hiring, um, the thought process starts a little bit before you even start to look at a resume. So I think what you have to identify is the strategy in how we hire people and how we think about them. Good point. And one of the problems I think, I, so I wrote a, a book which is on Amazon called Why Technology Recruiting is Broken and What to Do About It. And it actually, because I'm in the technology field, this is what I'm writing about. But this, if there are small companies out there that have you know three employees and nothing to do with technology, Everything that I'm about to say, I believe, applies just as much to you as it does to Apple or IBM or anybody else that's hiring. In the industry, in other words, it's not sure. a, a hiring. It's, it's a strategy, right? It's so I think strategy. the strategy, the default strategy that's been handed down from generations is not a good one. And that strategy is weed out the weak. And so what people do is they post a job online and they say, they might say some great things about what a great company you are and why, why you would want to work for our company. Okay. But then in the job description, they don't really describe the job or the outcome or the work, but instead they give you a bunch of requirements that you must have, the must haves in order to be interviewed for this job. There, there's so many problems with that, but let me, let's just step back and recognize that the attempt to do that in the first place is inherently saying, we are going to weed out the week and see who's left. So if I get 100 resumes, I can very efficiently get rid of 97 of them because they have to have five years of QuickBooks or whatever it is, but these people have four or less. And that is, so that, that's a strategy. And whether people admit that or not or can articulate that, that's what they're doing. My strategy is to identify the strong. It's completely opposite. And so what happens is, we will start a job posting or a conversation about a job with someone saying, this is the company, this is the work, would you be interested in having a conversation to see if this is a good career fit for you? I don't even tell them very much about it. That's when I'm being proactive and reaching out. That's right. When I'm doing what I would call pull marketing, right? There's push marketing and pull. When you do pull marketing, you post a job and then you hope that the right people apply, which is fine, right? Your fingers when crossed that so you job, have the right sure, candidates coming. Right? So where the weed out the week problem happens is yes. that they post, most people will post, the, first of all, they'll call it a job description and then they'll start mentioning things that are not describing jobs. They're just describing attributes of people. So you can't call it a job description. And, and almost the, the analogy that I use is if you, so forget about corporate life and, and real business. Pretend you were having um, a private party at your house this weekend with 50 people and you needed to hire a caterer really quick. 
you would never go online on Craigslist or anywhere and post something on Facebook or call your friends. You would never say, uh, I'm having a party this weekend and I really need to identify someone that has seven years of experience with convection ovens and four years with spatulas and three years with cutting knives. You. Right? Like I have experience with all that and I, you do not want me catering your party. So instead in real life, this is what we do is we say, I need someone for this Friday for 50 people at this time to make this many dishes and this many are going to be chicken or whatever it is, right? You get right to the outcome and you kind of ignore all the tools and you just say, and so you, so you start evaluating caterers or any company that you hire outside of a professional setting like that for your home, um, you start evaluating them based on whether you believe they're capable of doing the work, right? And how do we know if they're capable? We ask about their past experience doing similar things. We get referrals, right? Well, the problem is that the analogous way that corporate America uh, views resumes that come piling in is they have this stack of paper. Actually, mm -hmm. it's worse than that now because worse. now they have some low paid person or an algorithm. So they actually have a, so, so no human will even see your resume if it says you must have five years of X experience. And, and, and I'm going to keep you up there for right? a moment, and Stephen, and that's a very good, good, excellent point that you just brought up. Technology, right? Because this is all about technology too. So it's true because I know from the fact that um, I have friends that are looking for a job. So they, they go to Career Builder. They go to, uh, what was the other one they have? Uh, their Indeed. List. Yeah. Indeed.com. In, yeah. Monster. Indeed and all those. So those are the well known national online, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, call it job sites. The thing is, you're right. They actually, they go through a process of scanning almost, right? And sure. kind of figuring out whether uh, you're going to be, uh, you know, uh, whether you have the potential uh, to even make it to the end of the, of the batch. Of but I think they're asking bad questions, right? And so if you're evaluating, if, if the tech, so I'm not opposed to technology. I think that automating something sure. that you're doing manually is is fundamentally amazing however if it works apply, if, if, it if works. it's a good thing to do and so we confuse efficiency with effectiveness Thank right you. so we have to be efficient i mean there's no way you can spend 10 minutes on each resume reading 300 resumes nobody can nobody can do that effectively so you have to think how can i be efficient but there's a better way to be efficient and actually care about getting a good outcome. What is the it then, please, please. So, so, so far I've only ripped on, I've, I've only talked negatively about what's done. So I'm gonna well, tell you, 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 just, of you just some of the things what to surf. do about it. You only touched the surface. We want to get right. good well, stuff out well, of it. Well, but, but I'm pointing out the problem. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna give people sure. what I hope is some useful information. So whether you're hiring someone who is just gonna do a very short term project as an independent contractor, it could be a the smallest graphic design project, design my book cover, right? Okay. That's an example of when you, what you would hire someone for um, all the way through you know, a long-term employee. I think you have to get set in your mind, you have to look at your business and what that person has to accomplish on the job in order to be considered successful. And when you write a job description or when you, even if you don't write it, if you're a small enough company where you can just talk to people about it and you're not putting out uh, job postings on, on job boards like the ones you mentioned, right. um, you're talking about it in terms of the outcomes, right? So you don't get to say must have good communication skills and must have five years of QuickBooks. What you can say is to be successful on this job, you have to communicate with the CFO of our company and with external vendors, right? To, to do this. You have to utilize QuickBooks in order to prepare a consolidated financial reporting for a billion dollar company. Those are outcomes. Those are not tools. So my point there is it's very possible then that you might find someone who has maybe only six months of experience with QuickBooks as an example, but lots of experience with another tool so they're not experts in QuickBooks, but it would take them another three weeks to be an expert because they are an expert on the other stuff, right? right? So by not assigning arbitrary requirements, like you must have X number of years, what you're doing is you're allowing good people to come in because there might be the best fit on the planet for a job will disqualify themselves when they see must have five years and they think I only have three years, 
I'm not going to waste my time, no, right? No, you're right. But it's who it. says that someone with only three years of experience doing something well can't do the job you want them to? Why would you, why would you force that? The reason that people force it is because efficiency. It's easy to throw out resumes and see what you have left. So here's what we do. Here's the opposite, and everyone's welcome to steal this. Um, it's in my book, and I talk about it, and that we have systems that do this. So what when we post a job, this is, this is it. Is I, we're starting from the What's perspective. Your secret sauce, come on. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. I, honestly, like aside from business and our company, I'm passionate about this because it's really frustrating for me the way everybody plays. I this call it resume working. roulette. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help them hire better people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help people looking for jobs get more meaningful work. It's, it's broken in a lot of areas. So if, if people take this on, whether or not they do business with me ever, um, I'll be super happy about it. So one way that we do this is, I'll, I'll give you an easy example. If you had someone, let's say you wrote a book and you had to hire a graphic artist to do a cover for your book. Okay. So this is a very short-term project, right? You're not hiring an employee right. to sit in your office. It's a temp project. Um, yep. It's a very short-term project. So you mm -hmm. might go on Upwork or any of these freelance sites and post a job, right? <clears throat> so one of the things I'll do is I'll describe what I need them to do. I am writing a book about XYZ, and I would like someone to create a cover for that book that has these elements, and, and then I'll put something that says, very important, please read this first. Only apply if you can send me one and only one link or attachment that has the most relevant book cover that you designed, the, mo the closest to what I'm asking for. Only one. So here's what happens. Good I'm news. not disqualifying Good anyone. But if you go on, if you're familiar with Upwork or Odesk yeah. or Elance or any of these, sure. many times when you go on there, and you post something within 12 hours, you've got, you know, dozens of, of people saying, I'll do this and I can do it for $50. I'll do this mm -hmm. for $300. Well, what happens is I'm not weeding out people. They are weeding themselves out because what I notice is that 90% of the people are not reading something that I put in there that says, this is very important. Read this first. Please apply this way. So the ones that do apply that way are maybe 20%. So now instead of looking at, you know, 10 um, offers, right, to do this, 10 bids, I can ignore those because guess what? Even if they're really good at what they do, I don't want to work with someone that is unprofessional and unreliable and who, because attention to detail is important, right, in my business. And, and if you stop ignore you a detail that says, read this first, we don't need to work together. Best of luck. Steve, that's amazing, amazing. I want to I kind, of, kind of recap that part because I think that's so true. And actually, I just think I've seen that like in two job descriptions where it said, mm. you know, important or they will put, you know, um, uh, you know. Some people will say, please say I am human so that I know that a human read this. That's another one that people do. That's in, smart. Uh, in, but a very small <laughs> percentage, the majority, like you said, like you, you were saying, it's just a traditional old fashioned They're way. They're copying and pasting. They're very long. And, but you know what the beginning of it says? It says, I have read your requirement thoroughly and I believe that my company is the best. It's like, really, you read it thoroughly? <laughs> how, how about the most important part, right? right. So, so my point is this. I'm my business partner and I joke about this all the time. This is her line that I'm stealing. She says, uh -oh. you know, people, you, well, I have permission. You are. Okay. okay. Says, Just, we don't want to get in trouble here. <laughs> right, right. Okay. In recruiting, people spend so much time weeding out the weak when the weak are happy to weed themselves out for you. You don't have to concentrate on them. Isn't that great? That. Like that it's such awesome. a great realization that I don't have to force someone to have five years of graphic design experience. I don't care how many years they have if they can do a good job for a good price, right? I'm going to have them do it. So what happens is two things. I'm testing one, I'm testing an attribute that's important to me, which is attention to detail. I don't want someone to email me and tell me how attentive they are to detail. I want to see examples that they are, right? And then the second thing that I'm testing is relevance to what I need them to do. So someone might be, you know, the, the best graphic artist in the world, but maybe not the best for doing a book cover for the kind of book that I want, right? For you. Maybe great person right? Very highly skilled, but not a good fit for this project right now for me. And that's fine. Exactly. So when someone says, I see what you're doing and I love this kind of content and 
here's one book cover that I did that I think is in line with what you want. I'm happy to talk to those people all day. And my database is filled with people that respond like that. So now when you take it into a longer term project, because in my business, we have big companies calling me saying, I need a Cognos administrator, IBM Cognos administrator for six months in Salt Lake City starting Monday. That's what I get. So wow. I say, great, what do they have to do? And then sometimes my clients that don't know me as well will say, well, they have to have, be Cogno certified and they have to have five years of blah, blah, blah. And I say, got it, got it. But what are they going to do with their certification and their five years of experience? Because the, the pitch here is this. The punchline is it doesn't matter what you have. It matters what you do with what you have. So it doesn't matter that you have an MBA. It matters how you can apply whatever you learned. It doesn't matter that you have contacts. It matters that you can sell to your contacts. It doesn't matter that you have five years of QuickBooks. It matters that you can use it to do something that someone needs them to do, right? Okay. That's what matters. So what we do in a larger situation like this where it's a longer term project and it's close to like an employee setting because they're going to be there. Some of our short term projects are, you know, three years and running. So these people look like employees, right? Our consultants that come on are experts. So when I have to post a job because we don't already have someone in our network, the way we set it up is we, we put out a job posting that is, first of all, as much as possible, relevant and actually interesting. There's, there's no law that says job descriptions have to be boring. And it won't be interesting to everyone, right? Like not everyone's super interested in accounting and that's fine. But some people are, right? And for some people, it would be an amazing career move to see a job posting like, you know, we are for the first time in our company's history, we are upgrading to, you know, QuickBooks or to some other financial or Hyperion so we can do major reporting. And so we have this awesome project where we're combining data and like that is interesting to the people that you are fishing for. Maybe not everyone, right? right? But, but to those people. So it's, it's compelling to the target audience just like an advertisement would be. And then second, it describes the outcomes. And here's the rule, everybody. I want you to remember this. When you write a job description, okay. every, so I would put three to five bullet points that answer the question, what does the person have to do in order to be considered successful? And every sentence has to start with a verb. That means upgrade to QuickBooks, whatever version. Implement this, create this. Um, integrate data for our new CRM. Everything has to start, and you can put tools in there if you want. You can say, you know, using QuickBooks, but I still want, it would be better for you if you could start having conversations with people and identifying them as a good fit or not based on whether they are capable of doing these things. So then what happens is 100 people apply, right, to this job. Well, right. I don't see any of it. I don't see resumes. I don't see applications. I don't see anything because they get an auto reply from me. And it says, thanks so much for your interest in this job. If you'd like to continue this conversation, as you can see, there are three objectives here. Please write one concise sentence under each one that tells me your most relevant accomplishment. So if the number one thing is upgrade to QuickBooks version X, all I want to see is I have upgraded to QuickBooks version X, you know, five times for these four companies. Great. Next question, right? Like that's all I want to know is are you confident and capable and motivated to do this? Well, unfortunately, what percentage of people do you think get back to me after that? So I if I get a hundred applications and then they get an auto reply, how many do you think come back with an answer? Uh, I would guess less than 5%. Exactly right. So three out of a hundred reply to that, which is great because I didn't weed out the week. No, they did. Not. They did. Right. So now I have three great people that can articulate what they need, what they've done in the past compared to what I need them to do now. Yeah. They've shown me that they're motivated because they actually took three minutes and did that. And they've shown me their communication skills. Right. Because if I say, please write one concise sentence and somebody copies four paragraphs off their resume and is lazy, you've you've just weeded yourself out again. Right. Because it's really easy to do what I'm telling you to do. So then I get to have great conversations with people and we build our our network of people that even if they're not a great fit for this role, they're smart people 
who can articulate what they do and what they want to do. So somebody might see that and they say, wow, I really like this. You know, now that I look at this, I could do all that stuff, but I'm more of an administrator and not a developer. I'm more of a developer than an architect or whatever it is. And then I get to pick up the phone and talk to somebody that uh, that knows what they want to do and knows what they're confident doing. And that's how, that's how I build the database of, of, you know, smart people. So on the other side of that, where, where the hiring side has to change is they have to stop writing job descriptions in terms of arbitrary required skills because everybody I know that's moderately intelligent at some point has been in a job and done well despite not having the training or certification or, I mean, I remember learning software in jobs that I was in that I never heard of. Right. And then three months later, people were coming to me asking questions about it and I never heard of it three months ago. And I know many other people who are much better at it than me. So if you would look at one of our consultants resume and see that this person had six months of experience on a certain tool, you would be a fool to take that person for, you know, that, like this is a person that might as well be an expert in it because his six months is worth, you know, who knows what it is for the average person. But if you don't start the conversation that way and you just say, here's my job description, but I don't want to talk to you unless you have more than five years of experience with this, that's a bad way to start a conversation. And right? I'm here to interrupt there for a moment, uh, Steve. I think another thing that uh, I think is worth bringing up right now during the conversation is the fact you're right. I mean, you could have five years, uh, you know, perhaps like you said, we just put an example of using accounting software such as QuickBooks, right? Uh, that a lot of people think is very user friendly because it looks like it, but it's still accounting <laughs> software. And boy, I've seen people make a lot of mistakes, which are horrible. Talking to one. <laughs> but, you know, that's the same thing as, you know, uh, try and get, what, what was that big engineer software, CAD or something like that? CAD, yeah, yeah. Right? And you can just, I cannot just go there and think that in two, three days I can learn it all. It sure. takes time. But here's right. where I think it's really important. I don't know if you, you might agree disagree with me here, right? Um, and the thing is, it's how recent. Mm. And you've done it. Because I could have learned something, especially when it comes to technology and software, right? Mm -hmm. Three years ago. But mm -hmm. if I haven't been practicing almost on a daily basis or weekly, yeah. what happens? Right, for sure. But I think so, even though the recency of using a certain tool is super important, okay. what I, what I want to get back to is if I don't know a person and they're applying for a job and we're having a, a real human conversation, the most important thing that I want to get down first, and then we'll get into personality fit and cultural fit and whether it's actually a, considered a career move and all, all the other stuff. But the very first rung on the ladder to me is mm -hmm. I want them to understand what they have to do on the job, not what they have to come in and have, because nobody cares what you have the day mm -hmm. after you start work, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe you, you have a connection with the CEO and that's how you got a job. Great. Now you're on the job. That doesn't matter what you have anymore. Now you have to do your job. So I want them to know what they have to do and I want them to be able to articulate why they are confident that they can do the job. Hey, Steve, so, I'm sorry to interrupt there. Yeah. Is, that, is that the thing? I mean, it's not what you know, it's who you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, so that is part of it. But, but who you know can get you in the door. But, but the thing is, what are you going to do once you get in the door? Thank you. You're right. going to make that CEO look really bad, right, if you don't perform right. well. So it's true that who you know gets you in the door, right? You could be the son of a famous actor. But if you're a bad actor, no one wants to hire you. No one wants to put you in a movie that doesn't sell, right? It's bad business. So, um, so I think that even though it's important to know how recent their skill is on a certain software, if somebody can articulate that, so you mentioned CAD, right? Let's say a good part of the person's job involved them creating drawings in CAD and someone wanted to say, I'm really confident that I can do it. I've seen CAD before. I've never used it. But for the last 10 years, I've been using the other, I don't, I don't, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know what other tools are, but the major competitive tool to CAD 
right. I've been designing and I'm an architect and I manage a team of 10 people and I make sure everybody does this and that. Well, all of a sudden, if, if that person can convince me that they're confident and they're interested in doing this job, I have no problem, even if they have zero experience with CAD, if we both believe that they're confident they can do the work. So that's what it comes down to. This, this is what I believe like overall, right? If, if I had to just give a, a one sentence overview is that whenever anyone hires anyone else, even if it's a family member that you're hiring, someone that was referred to you by an employee, someone that came out of nowhere on the internet and applied for a job, I don't care who it is. When you decide you're going to hire someone, you did that because you are convinced and hopefully they're convinced that they mm -hmm. are capable and motivated of doing the job, period. Confidence. Right. So how do we, so, so what is the conversation that leads us both to saying, yes, this is a good fit for us. Right. And if you can articulate some of the things that you've done in your past that are relevant, relevant, it doesn't mean the exact thing, but if it's, if it's because some skill sets are portable, right? I bet you could learn another accounting software 20 times faster than me because I still can't figure out QuickBooks and I have a lot of hours invested in it, right? But, but if you're an expert in this, you're gonna get this so much faster than me, right? So at least, and that doesn't mean you have to hire everybody that says, I've never seen that tool that I can use it, but you at least allow people, you don't wanna lose people that, um, that could be a good fit. And so the, the two biggest mistakes that companies make, I think when they're hiring or when they're evaluating people for fit or no fit based on their resume. Right. The, the two big mistakes is that you're qualifying people because they have five years of X or whatever it is, but they might not be able to do the work. They might not even be interested in doing the work, but you never even said what the work was. And the second biggest problem is, and you'll never hear from these people, is that you've disqualified really good people who are capable and motivated, but you disqualified them because you forced them to have some set of requirements that in the end doesn't matter. What matters is if they can do the work. That's what makes them qualified, right? I do agree with you, Steve. And, and, and you know, going back, um, sometimes I think because of the traditional system that has, well, a lot of, a lot of HR managers in this case, like I was saying, mentioned a little bit earlier, um, They've been following the system over and over and over. And even though technology has kicked in, like, like we mentioned, um, they're still relying on, you know, cleaning up the weed, right? And thinking they're making a, a pre-selection based, again, on things that they believe that it's going to make that person do the right job. Mm -hmm. Without realizing... Find the right beyond, fit. Yeah. Right. Beyond that, that piece of paper... Mm -hmm. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. I really believe that, it, and I, did, I, I based this, I'm, I, I've never done an HR, you know, role, mm -hmm. so I'm very, you know, uh, very sincere about it. But again, because I've been able to share the same common space uh, sure. with probably three HR managers so far in my lifetime, I have overheard all these things and changes and what's going on. But just what we're talking about, how they go through the selection, mm -hmm. I always found it to be so insufficient because yeah. it's such a waste of time, not only to the employer, it's really to the candidates that are coming. Um, mm -hmm. So can you do the job? That's what it comes right. down to. I don't and, care and what- the, the, the qualifier there is you have to describe the job in the first place. I mean, the sad thing is, if you go online right now and just search any, any job in any industry, I guarantee you that most of the things that are written under the words job description are not descriptions of jobs. No, they're, not. they're just requirements for people. And that, that's the problem is that how can you even have a conversation with someone about whether they're capable of doing the work if you never describe the work? You're just describing tools. It's like the caterer. Do you, do you know how to use a knife? How many years do you have? It's like, I don't care. I don't care how you cut the stuff. You don't even have to use a knife as far as I'm concerned. I just need you to yeah. make sure that plates get on the table and the Thank food is you. good, right? That's like a good the point. Outcome. Yeah, the outcome exactly. Matter, right? Yeah, and, and and here's the thing. That's that's very interesting, um, and I, and I like that analogy that you do with 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 a chef or someone else that doesn't require well what they think high you know skills profession. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I, like I say, from my own perspective, what I see uh, is like I say, I always thought, wow, the system, I don't think it really works. And here's another, after they have cleaned up the weeds and they think, oh, now I have all these wonderful resumes. They look so good on paper, <laughs> right? Now they're starting to interview. And here's what I understand. I think that a phone interview, it's very important to get acquainted with the candidate, sure. to know whether or not, not only that they're going to be a good match to your organization, but also the candidate needs to know if I'm going to be happy where I'm planning to go totally work. Agree. Because if yeah. you're going to be unhappy, right. yeah. and this is something I want you to touch base really uh, sure. briefly, if you don't mind, please, uh, mm -hmm. Steve, because to me, I'm a firm believer that, like you said, you can have the best, and, and well due respect to everyone out there, yes, I have degrees, I have certifications, I have credentials, mm -hmm. blah, 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 and I can keep talking about myself, which is not part of this episode, but I'm always striving to learn. Knowledge is powerful, but we need to share it too. And the reason is that I feel that there's people that have the highest degrees out there, master degrees, and they thrive for that. And yet they're lacking something, which is personality. They're lacking to fit into the environment sure. and the culture of a company. Mm -hmm. That's important. Let's Absolutely. talk a little bit about that, please. Yeah, sure. Well, when it comes to, so culture is kind of one of those things that's a little bit gray and it's hard to define sometimes. And I have a couple of, of very specific things that I think, because I know even top performers, people that consistently perform very well and they keep getting promoted and everywhere they go, every, everyone loves them everywhere they go. But even a top performer can underperform if some of these things aren't in place. So this doesn't have to do so much with a personality or communication style or being a positive person being, versus being like kind of a toxic negative person. But even before that, the, some of the top reasons why top performers underperform are because they join a company that doesn't resonate with them in the growth phase. And what I mean by that is the culture at a company that is a startup in San Francisco that has 10 people sitting around a desk is very different from the culture of like Ford Motor Company here in, in Michigan, where I'm from. Where well, they has, have a private office. Each one of them work in a private office. They but, have but, the, but just the vibe of, you know, having to network within your company and yes. meeting people that were not meeting people that work for your company. Um, and again, and then there are mid-sized companies that have a certain pay and bureaucracy and none of these things are better or worse but they are a better or worse fit for people so just the growth phase or the size of a company is part of what I would consider culture and if you put someone who is used to a fast-paced environment in a big company it's not that the big companies are bad or overly bureaucratic and terrible I'm not ripping on them I'm just saying it's a bad fit for that person and even a good top performing quality professional person will underperform. The other thing is, no matter what the size of the company is, right. you know, I always say people leave or stay with companies because of people, not companies. So it's kind of weird to say Ford Motor Company is this or that. It's a great company or it's a bad company. What you really mean is your boss sucks or the three to five people that you work with most, you don't get along with. It's not the company, there's no company there, right? So people might leave a job because of their boss, but that's not the company, that's their boss. So the second thing that I look for in fit is simply a fit with the management style of the person they'll be reporting to and how they can get along, regardless of what I think about anybody's personality, right? And so just, it, it's funny because a lot of people will say out loud, I can't handle being micromanaged. I don't like that. Now, personally, I don't like being micromanaged. I'm sure I'm one of them too. However, there are actually people that thrive in environments where they are micromanaged. And most of those people know that. But I would say, you know, I lived in Japan for, for many years. There are people that if you just said, I don't care how you do what you do, but just do it, mm -hmm. they would be out of their element. They want someone looking over their shoulder and they can do a great job. So my point is there isn't a better or worse or right or wrong, but there is a better or worse fit for you. And so things like size of the organization, pace of how we do business, flexibility, our office hours being in versus, you know, telecommuting, all these different things, those matter. But again, I, I want to be clear that I think before you get into any of these things, 
I don't think you have to do very much work evaluating the personality of someone if they can't do the work. So I think all of this conversation that happens next should, should, should be a, a combination of skills and experience and attitude and communication style and fit for the environment because you're already talking to people that you believe can do the job. Then you evaluate among those people, right? So to do a recap here, so pretty much what we kind of, you know, getting out of this, the whole thing is that we need to realize that first is, can you do the job? That's where the company needs to come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, maybe kind of moving away from what's been known as the traditional system mm -hmm. and, and realizing that put their, now what your competitor does and what they're looking for, what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. in your company okay right the outcomes and, and i think that in the description it has to say this is what our company is looking for right not to right. generalize it because again your competitor a b and c has mm -hmm. the same kind of similar description for that position no sure. it's what you're looking for as a company especially if you're private health that's very important because if you're a small company um and i think another thing is talk about the company you yeah. see if there's a good fit, a good connection with that candidate. You know, sure. explain your background, how you started in the company. See if it's something that's going to fit with that person too. Do right. a phone interview. And now I'm going to tell you this before we wrap up, Steve, really mm -hmm. fast. I will say that I always, and I could be wrong about this by all means, i always been uh, against the three interview process. I think that is such a huge waste of time. And I know some people might disagree with me out there, especially top companies and big HR managers. I'm sorry. I, Is I, that, do you feel like that's the standard, the three interviews? I, I've seen or? a lot of company, oh, okay. companies going through three interviews where you oh, need to interview first with uh, the department manager. And then mm -hmm. you need to interview with HR. And then maybe now you need to interview with what, the president or the owner. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's such a waste of time, not only for the mm -hmm. company, but it's a waste of time for the candidates who are going there. Mm -hmm. I believe that based on, I, I don't know, maybe I've just been always interviewing the first time, <laughs> but you know, I really, I, as, a, you know, as an owner myself, I believe that when I hire somebody, I do a phone interview, I get to do it one time, hopefully in person, right? If mm -hmm. it's someone working you know, sure. um, inside my office. But other than that, after that, I might just do three or five people and make a decision. Because mm -hmm. the reality is that I need to see what you're capable of. Right. In the, in yeah. the job. And until you don't start working for me, unfortunately, I have to take the risk. I do. Exactly. Yeah. Because the truth is, no matter how many interviews you do, you don't know what it's like to work with anyone until you work with them. That's the truth. I mean, you can try and tease out as much as you want, but we're human. So and that is so true. And again, you talk about virtual services and people that you hire from different states and sure. maybe overseas. How many people we don't hire overseas now in these days, right? With I have a graphic artist that's been working for me for 12 years. It's in the Philippines. I've never met him. I've met him like this, but I've never that's met him. He's that's great. It. Yeah. But as long as you have confidence that this person is doing the right work or job, mm -hmm. however you want to call it, quote unquote, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, as long as you feel comfortable that they have the capacity, they have the skills that requires for your work, not mm -hmm. for the next competitor right. or next company, forget about yeah. all of them. You need to concentrate on yourself. And I think this is really the big recap of the whole thing is that to people understand is you want to put in that description, again, what you're seeking in, in, in candidate and what's going to make that person qualify, but also talk about the environment, the culture of the company, because mm -hmm. that might not be a good fit for the candidate. That's why you sure. need to come and, and, and be with that person physically if possible to understand whether or not it's going to work for you. And, or at least through video, right? We can sure. hire people oh, through yeah. video now in these days. And this, it's the closest that you're going to be to a person without being shoulder to shoulder. Sure. Um, yeah. What state are you in, by the way, Steve? I'm in Detroit, Michigan. There you go. You're in Detroit. I'm all the way in Florida. But mm. we're having a, a live sure. conversation. Face to face, yeah. See, they're going to see a replay, but we are having a live conversation yeah. right now. So the same thing. So you know what? Now in these days, there is no limit. This, you know, we could be so connected and yet have an interview like this and have mm -hmm. a feel. Uh, do I want to give a shot to this person? Is this person worth my investment, you know, that I'm sure. going to hire? Um, so please, before we wrap up, uh, Steve, 
your book again and, and, and do you have any kind of newsletters or anything else that people can reach out to you? Um, please let Yeah, us sure. I appreciate it. Well, um, all of my business activities are on a website called steveachoresources.com and there are links to my companies and my books and everything there. Um, and I'm happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn and give you any advice that you need. My name's Steve Acho, and I think I'm the only one on LinkedIn unless there's some imposter. Uh-oh. Last I checked, I was the only one. You should be constantly connected. I look like this, so. Do you really? Okay. Yeah, in real <laughs> <laughs> Just in this case. me you live, yeah. Okay. So if it doesn't look like this, it's a different guy. <laughs> well, Steve, it's been a pleasure to have you, and, and you know, you brought so much insight in. And again, I hope people really listen to these kind of, you know, episodes because it, it, we need to, there's a drastic change that needs to take place. Mm. Uh, the, the, this thing about the old system, it worked back then, it's not working now. And, and I think that we, evolution of time, we need to also adapt and we need to be flexible. And um, also, you know, really, I mean, the millennial generation is very different. I mean, sure. you know, it's different to, to my generation, which I'm a little bit an X generation, and I admit it. Um, but, you know, what is different? So we need to adapt and we need to accommodate this thing. And I do believe that, like I said, it's not necessary to do three interviews. That's just my opinion. It's a waste of time, money, and everything. But also the fact that, you know, you're able to see what the person is capable of doing. Give them the chance to do it. At least try them out for three days. There you yeah. go. Do the trial for three days. Sure. How much did you lose? Not much. Right. Right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, so I think that's awesome. You know, so thank you, Steve, for bringing up so much great content information to my show. I really appreciate it. And, and hopefully uh, we're going to be back again in another episode. And I think I'm sure we can discuss other things that are going to really help a lot of people. Uh, not only companies to know to how to hire the right person, right? Um, but also the, the candidate, the other side. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Because the last thing you want to do is that like you say you have a bad boss and I hate to tell you, I don't care if you pay me six figures. I really don't care. If I can know that I have to wake up and I'm going to be stressed and yeah, I'm going sure. to be sad and I'm going to be angry going to work because I have a bitter, most of your waking hours matters. Yeah. Thank you. I have a bitter <laughs> boss or I have someone sure. who's disrespecting me and I see yeah. that a lot happening too. Mm. Um, you go there to work not to have to sustain and support the attitude of other people's personality issues. Mm. No one deserves to be disrespected. And I say that sure. because I've seen that here, at least in Florida, we see that very common. Companies, uh, owners, thinking that their entitlement is I pay you and I can treat you however I like. And if you don't like it, you know where the yeah. door is. Don't Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that looked up to Steve Jobs for the, some of the wrong reasons. Yeah, you got yeah. that right. <laughs> so anyhow, Steve, That's thank another you episode. once again. You know, and we'd be in touch. And again, to all my dear audience out there, thank you for watching, for liking and sharing. And remember, not only we have the webcast, we also have the podcast. And I also have a newsletter. So by all means, come and register. There's great tips that we offer there. And do you have a newsletter, by the way, uh, Steve? No, no, mm. no, no, no. Something you might want to look at. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everyone. Until next episode, thank you for your time, and I wish you a lot of success. Bye-bye, everyone.